वेलकम टू बायजूज आई एस एन अ वेरी वेरी स्पेशल एडिशन ऑफ आवर वीकली रिव्यू ऑफ इंटरनेशनल अफेयर्स स्पेशल इन द सेंस दैट वॉट वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस एट सम लेंथ दिस वीक इज अ क्राइसिस विच हैज ब्रॉड द वर्ल्ड टू द ब्रिंक ऑफ अ कैटेस्ट्रॉफिक वॉर इन द मिडल ईस्ट एंड इट इज नॉट ओनली अ क्राइसिस विच हैज कम टू अ बॉइलिंग पॉइंट इन रिसेंट टाइम्स इट इज अ क्राइसिस विच हैज सिमर्ड ऑन एंड ऑफ फॉर ऑलमोस्ट हंड्रेड ईयर्स it illustrates a very characteristic feature of international relations that like an old illness like a chronic sickness there are crises in international relations between the nations which can lie dormant for decades and suddenly flare up and create a problem for the whole world what we are talking about is the palestine israeli conflict which has assumed very dangerous proportions in recent weeks so please listen carefully and try to recollect whatever you can the main points of this long drawn conflict we shall of course begin with what is happening then give you a historical background and try to explain to you the geopolitical the real political the ideological and the other significances dimensions of this conflict and of course as usual we would try to point out how it affects india's national interest It was only a couple of months ago or perhaps less when it appeared that the international relations in Middle East was about to achieve a new equilibrium. Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates had tried to normalize their relationship with Israel or you might say Israel had tried to build up its relationship to normalcy with Saudi Arab and UAE and some other Gulf countries and it appeared this was being done with the help of the then US president's son-in-law Mr Kushner. and it appeared that once this happens the tensions would reduce in this area but this was not to be suddenly it is not only because biden came to white house suddenly israel pushed the ante of the conflict and almost the threshold of a new intifada a mass uprising in the occupied territories of gaza of west bank east jerusalem suddenly flared up why did this happen in the past two weeks more than 225 palestinians have lost their lives many more have been thousands plus have been injured in israel the death toll is lower because such is the asymmetry of power between the two adversaries although some rockets launched by the palestinians from gaza strip have landed in israel beating their iron dome anti missile defense system but the number of casualties in israel is 10 12 at the most and some of them have died in rioting within israel so there's a different issue altogether while it may not appear a very large uh, statistics in terms of deaths and injured what it is causing concern is that in past twice or thrice this has happened when israel has tried to launch a war against palestinians in occupied territories in a racist almost colonial exploitative manner trying to cleanse them and have a solution of this problem as far as israel is concerned finally what happened this time was that in the month of ramzan when the palestinians gathered in al aqsa mosque in is jerusalem to pray they were uh, taunted by racist slurs by right wing extremist jewish elements the police tried to disperse them using unnecessary force this led to almost a stampede like situation and this was resented by the palestinians not only in is jerusalem but those who are in hundreds of thousands as citizens of israel second class citizens but palestinian arabs then of course the people in uh, the west bank which is nominally a palestinian territory autonomous embryonic state in the making controlled totally divided totally by israel there was resentment and the gaza strip palestinians tried to launch in protest certain rockets against targets in israel what we must not forget that the israel has such a preponderance of power and such an efficient technologically sophisticated anti missile system called iron dome that very few of these short distance missiles can reach strategic targets in israel they are more like gigantic fireworks they are more like symbolic protests expressing the will of the palestinians that they are not prepared to surrender but this time what happened was that there were hundreds of missiles launched at the same time and some managed to reach targets in southern israel this gave an excuse to the israeli prime minister benjamin netanyahu a hardliner to say that israel is using aggressive tactics to defend itself and to defend the self defense is an argument which even the charter of the united nation grants to a state now here the double standards are quite transparent if israel can say 
that we are exercising our right to self defense when we are launching an attack from air sea and land against the palestinians in occupied territories the palestinians can also say that faced with almost genocidal oppression by the israeli government they also were exercising the rockets as their right to self defense but unfortunately the palestinians are not a sovereign state as such although the un recognizes their status as a people who can use arms to carry on a struggle against colonial oppression but because of the politics ideological division in the security council the it is not treated even handedly now why is the crisis at this particular time taking place two interesting things one is what we referred to a little earlier if there is a redrawing of power equations in middle east palestinians know that if this happens then they would be isolated even more as far as the israeli is concerned the problem is not only what the israelis feel in the past 2 years there have been four elections they have failed to form a majority government coalitions have come have not been very stable and benjamin netanyahu at the moment is in the dock charged with massive corruption and he was about to go to jail when this crisis was built up so some people believe that he is a stage manager crisis to remain in power and say that he is trying to save israel from attacks of uh, islamic terrorists and of course the definition of a terrorist is also very opportunistically defined and expressed some western countries the united states of america germany france united kingdom treat uh, hamas which is controlling the gaza strip as a terrorist organization but the majority of countries in european union other members of the united nations do not treat hamas as a terrorist organization they think that there might be elements in hamas which are beyond hamas's control which are terroristic but that is it at the moment there is some kind of an islamophobia in major european uh, countries like france and germany the palestinians have nothing to do with it but because palestinians are arabs they are islamic people they are identified it is better to for the some european countries to profile them as terrorists and they become equated with the terrorist elements of the dogmatic fundamentalist islamic variety who have been behaving very irresponsibly in some european countries so this is the broader background what we should keep in mind is that the palestinians they are never in their history fundamentalist islamic uh, people they were probably the best educated among the arabs they were professional they were more westernized they were secular and their natural inclination was towards socialism so you had in the context of the history the palestinians who had been displaced from their homeland by the creation of the artificial state a theocratic state uh, israel in 47 48 had been dispersed and rendered refugees now they always had this grievance that they were displaced illegitimately illogically unlawfully and they had a claim to their homeland so there is a long history of this now the problem starts even earlier now if you recall the jews always have projected themselves as a victimized people the most recent example of course was when the nazis in germany treated them in a genocidal manner millions of jews were consigned to concentration camps were sent to gas chambers were exposed to all kind of inhuman atrocities and when the war ended there was a guilty conscience not only in germany but in most european nations that due to priorities of war the jew jewish problem had not been addressed properly one should also not forget that there is a strong jewish lobby uh, moneyed controlling media in united states of america and they put pressure on the american administration successive administration to support israel and create israel and this also suited the american policy during the cold war now that is one part of the thing the other part is the palestinians did have a support base in the arab countries who two of the large arab countries or three actually uh, syria iraq and egypt at one time way back in late 50s and early 60s had governments which claimed to be socialistic they were secular and they tilted towards the then union of soviet socialist republics later on russia they received arms assistance they received technological assistance from them and this division of the arab world between the socialist secular supposedly and the islamic fundamentalist was very clearly divided saudi arabia was feudal traditional obscurantist rich in oil but fundamentalist orthodox 
not very tolerant. But the Palestinians, the Syrians, the Iraqis were not there. Now today if we see Palestinians as a people who support uh, jihad, we must keep in mind that the Palestinians have been pushed with their back to the wall and they have been forced to take assistance from their Arab neighbors who have slowly made it conditional that if they participate in jihad against Christianity and West, they can expect some aid, otherwise they can't. The second thing which we must keep in mind is, is the history since 56 during the Suez crisis where Nasser with his pan-Arabism had emerged victorious or so it appeared but then his regime lost popular support subsequently. Uh, he was replaced by governments which were neither socialistic either rhetorically or ideologically and when especially the Camp David agreements took place after that Egypt chose to make peace with the Americans and once they did that they made peace under American influence and pressure with Israel also. Now there are, there are two or three ironical situations in this case. If you remember the landmarks, the landmarks is the war of 1967, the war of 1973 and we will come to the intifadas, mass uprisings a little later. Now the two wars of 1967 and 1973 to begin with it appeared that if all the Arabs come together, Israel would lose out. But Israel fought in a do or die manner and after initial setbacks did defeat the combined Arabs both in 67 and 73. In just before 73, Arabs had tried ever since 1971 to use oil as a diplomatic weapon and put pressure on America and other Western countries. But in this case, the Arabs forgot that there was no unity among them. There were tribal divides, there were regional divides, there were national divides and they ultimately did, were not free from either corruption or from dynastic uh, succession. Now what, what this resulted in that not everybody was happy with the pan-Arabism of uh, Nasser, not everybody was happy with the revolutionary fervor in Algeria and they, this divided world, there were monarchies like Morocco and Jordan and then of course the reality of the commitment to socialism and secularism in Syria and Iraq was also always open to question. So when they realized after 67, despite the process of Oslo peace uh, process which said that look there should be compromise, there should be peace in this area for stability uh, of the world, peace and development and everybody should. So Israel temporarily signaled to the world temporarily only to win a respite that it was prepared for what is now called a two-state solution. That the Palestinians would continue to stay in the territory where they were living as refugees and they would be slowly given autonomy and they would probably be another state in the same geographical territory and Israel would be there and hopefully they would live in peace. Now one more interesting thing has to be remembered and noted here. It is the role played by the charismatic leadership of Yasser Arafat throughout this period. His uh, Palestinian Liberation Organization started as an organization which had taken up arms against uh, Israel to liberate the Palestinian people. He had a very large mass following but slowly he decided that this fight against Israel was a very uneven one and if, if Palestinians wanted to have a state of their own, they would have to make some compromises. Some people thought that he had betrayed the cause of Palestinians, some people thought that he was getting old and wanted to exercise power but what remains is that there were a few blemishes in PLO also. That The first few acts of terrorism were done by an organization called Al Fatah which had broken out of uh, the PLO and these were the original incidents of terrorism by the Black September group of aerial hijacking, of killing of Israeli sportspersons in Munich. So there is this taint that PLO cannot rid itself of association, guilt by association with some uh, fanatical terrorists. But what happened, what was of lasting damage to the Palestinian cause was that some elements in Hamas thought that Yasser Arafat was out of touch with the new generation and they undermined his authority in the Palestinian, uh, what was supposed to be the Palestinian state or Palestinian authority. Now there has been this problem all along. There has been a leadership in the West Bank, in East Jerusalem and to begin with in Gaza Strip which was basically led by followers of Yasser Arafat but subsequently Hamas gained ground there and Mahmoud Abbas who is the president of the Palestinian Authority now wields actually no real power. 
but it is not only because there were dissensions and differences differences among the Palestinians. The problem also was that the Palestinians, when they ended up as refugees in the neighboring Arab countries, fraternal countries like Jordan or Syria or Lebanon, uh, they were targeted by Israelis and these countries realized if they harbored Palestinians in their territories, they would be exposed as frontline states to attacks from Israel. So to protect themselves, they also betrayed the Palestinian cause and did not give them the kind of support which was expected. Palestinians re remained uh, hopeless refugees either in fraternal Arab countries or within there. What Israel did was something very sinister. While it accepted the two states in principle as a solution, it continued to build walls, erect barbed wire fences and try to divide the West Bank in a zone of occupation. They also used extremely inhuman methods, which was some people say that it is ironical that people who were themselves victims of Holocaust in the 40s in Nazi Germany suddenly became predators and made the Palestinians their victims. So they were pushed out of their homes. There were new Israeli settlers, the Jews who were given their houses, their properties, their lands, and slowly there was within the West, West Bank the ghettoization of the Palestinians. They couldn't move out freely. They didn't have law and order. They didn't have independent access to electricity or production of electricity or water supply or sewage. So for everything, they were dependent on Israelis. And the Israelis' army of occupation divided this supposedly second state which would coexist peacefully with Palestine into a battlefront. And there have been lots of deaths. And now as soon as the Palestinians found out that they had been betrayed but not only by their Arab brethren but the Israelis were raging on the deal which they had accepted in the Oslo peace process, they rose in mass revolt. These, are, these mass revolts, insurrections are what is called intifada. There was an intifada in 1993 which lasted for 4-5 years, thousands of lives were lost. Then there was a temporary lull, then there was second intifada in 2000 which continued for 3-4 years again more thousands of lives were lost, but after that was a brief lull. Then there was a brief lull for say 9, 10 years and 2006 and 2014, Palestinians rose in revolt again. So there is this extremely tragic situation where the Palestinians, two generations of Palestinians have grown up in West Bank, in East Jerusalem, within Israel itself, where they thought they have known nothing else but this chronic civil war going on, insurrection going on, they, they being victimized by the Iranian army. It may appear that one is giving a narrative which is very pro-Palestinian and very anti-Israeli. But let it be recorded in fairness that Israelis tried to propagate at one time that the younger generation of Israelis were looking for a peace dividend, wanted to live with their Arab brethren in peace. But this was again basically a stratagem to buy time. The Israelis were worried only about one country in the region and that country was Iran. They thought that if Iran acquires the nuclear weapons, it would be very difficult for them to survive. So all their energies were devoted towards subverting, sabotaging the Iranian nuclear program. And they, as long as they knew that they had the support of the United States, they could with impunity flout whatever commitments they had made to the United Nations. The United Nations Security Council has passed lots of resolutions over the decades, Security Council Resolution number 242 being the most famous. The Israelis have flouted them, they have been indifferent to them and Israel continues to behave like a rogue state. Even in the present context, even in the present conflict, things have been very, very disturbing. People had thought that when Biden comes, uh, he makes peace with uh, Iran, uh, he would exercise pressure on Israel to have a ceasefire immediately. But the statement made by Biden has been very disappointing. He repeated two things. He conceded the right of the Israelis to exercise warfare in their self-defense without talking about the right of self-defense of the Palestinians. He said that I would exercise uh, my influence to have a ceasefire but did not indicate any time frame for this. So the Israelis took advantage of this and Netanyahu repeatedly has made the claim that he will this time continue till he has broken the back of Hamas and the, and the thorn is removed from the flesh of Israel for all time to come. But this overlooks two extremely dangerous potentialities. If a people lose all hope, 
then of course they have nothing to lose afterwards. If they have lose, lost their close family members, if they have lost their homes and hearts, if there is no hope for them, if the children have grown up orphans nihilists, they are drawn towards cult of suicidal warfare or terrorism, which Israel might find it very difficult to cope with. It is already happening. It had never happened in the past that lakhs of Palestinian citizens, second class citizens nonetheless in the state of Israel, in the old city, have come out and there have been clashes of communal racial variety between the Jews and Arabs. This complexity is for the first time adding a volatility. One could argue that the Palestinians have no weapons, they have only Molotov cocktails, they can only indulge in stone throwing, but the brutal way the Iranian army suppresses them with live bullets, with stinking skunk water cannons, with stun guns, with grenades, and not allowing them access to hospitals, and the way they Israelis have targeted civilian buildings like schools, hospitals, media organizations. It is an absolute proof of the brutality and the violation of the laws of war and crimes against humanity which is there. But Israel being a sovereign country cannot be taken to an international criminal court or to the world court. And as long as the Americans are there to exercise their veto in the Security Council, they know that they have time enough to finish the Palestinians. Unfortunately, unfortunately for the Palestinians, the sideshows have always distracted from the intensity of the Palestinian problem. Either it is the humanitarian crisis in Yemen, which is larger than there, or it is the environmental crisis in African continent, which is larger, or it is piracy in Somalia, which is larger, or it is the war going on in Iraq or Syria, or it is instability in Libya or it is the very very volatile situation after the American withdrawal in Afghanistan or it is the re recurrence of terrorist violence in Pakistan or the Chinese control there. So where do we go from there? Now the problem is that some people thought that Israel was only trying to sabotage the US-Iranian deal and it had done that. Like the other simplistic explanation that Benjamin Netanyahu was trying to save his skin and cling on to power as long as he can. Now. This leads us to a very interesting situation. How does it affect the Indian national interest? The Indians have traditionally been very close, very friendly to Palestinians. Not only because India has a large Muslim population, as I said before, the Palestinians were not identified as Muslims to begin with. They were very different kind of Muslims, more progressive, more modern, more westernized, better educated, more secular, more socialistically inclined. All this has changed in the past few years. The personal relationship between the Indian leadership of Mrs. Gandhi's time and Yasser Arafat is also gone. The non-aligned movement is in a great disarray. India has drifted towards United States and is not in a position to assert its independent foreign policy especially in Middle East vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Palestinians and Israelis. India has in the past few years drawn very close to Israel also as due to our weapons trade with them, due to exchange of technology and we think that Israel is so much against Islamic terrorism that if India is confronted with Islamic terrorism, earlier the state of Jammu and Kashmir, now the Union territories of Kashmir and Jammu, the problem is that we think that Israelis can help us in a variety of ways from intelligence to military hardware to support. So we are unlikely to upset this apple cart as far as Israel is concerned. We have already drawn away from Iran. This leaves a very dangerous vacuum to be filled by either Putin's Russia or China of Xi. Now if this happens, India would have vacated space in Middle East and despite our claims that we have personal ties with the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, we have very close ties with the rulers of United Arab Emirates, our Prime Minister has got the highest civilian award from them, but the fact remains in this confrontation, even the Arabs will find it very difficult to keep quiet for long and if the pressure builds up on Biden to lend some kind of pressure on Israel, India would find itself between the cleft of the stakes. While our attention has been focused on whatever has been happening between Israel and Palestine, we have overlooked a sideshow, which again might turn pretty explosive anytime soon. This is the war theatre of Syria. In Syria, the fight continues between anti-Assad forces, which at one time were united with the interest of fighting uh, with the Islamic Caliphate, 
But right now, Islamic Caliphate has been defeated for the time being in Syria. It has offshoots in Africa. But no one can say that it cannot make a recurrence. If either Assad loses support or if there is a groundswell of opposition to Assad in Syria. But even more interesting developments are taking place in Iraq where Mustafa Khadimi, the new Prime Minister, has taken over. And he's a very interesting background. He was the chief of intelligence. Before that, he was a journalist. He is not a hardcore politician with mass appeal. And he's a very soft-spoken, technocrat kind of a person. And most people think that he is not likely to succeed. The vested interests are such, the Shia-Sunni divide, that he may not have the support of any important faction there. While we talk of Philistine and we talk of uh, um, Israel, we do not realize that how turbulent the situation in Iraq and Syria is. There are Kurds at one stage, there are Shia elements, there are lots of militias who, have, who are armed to fight the Caliphate or fight the Americans. Now we have come to a situation where these are almost independent warlords. Now the Iraqi Prime Minister has expressed the hope and declared his resolve that all arms ultimately should be controlled by the state. But how does he do it? His own position remains stable as long as the army remains loyal to him. But the army itself is divided along sectarian lines and people are getting fed up, not only of large scale corruptions, but inequalities in shortages. Now the Americans will withdraw from Iraq. Americans will withdraw from Syria like they have withdrawn from Afghanistan. But after their withdrawal, how the chaos will be handled, nobody knows. And if civil strife engulfs this whole area, once again, the whole area of Middle East will become very volatile and dangerous. So India has not only to talk about, think about the Israelis and the Palestinians, it has to worry about if there are any continuing eternal interests which India has. Eternal interest is a very odd word to use, but India had a very interesting presence in infrastructural development in terms of oil imports, both in Iraq and in Syria, and it had close ties with Egypt. Now, all that has changed in recent past. So, are we going to allow ourselves to be guided by either American or Western interests here? Or will we have an independent line dividing it from country to country? Or we would have a coordinated large picture about the Middle East. This is what we'll have to worry about in coming days. That is all we have for you this week. We devoted most of our time to one major issue, but this one major issue is worth three or four uh, issues talked separately because it merges into so many things. It merges into secularism versus Islamic fundamentalism. It is involved inextricably with racism, with violation of human rights, with uh, war crimes, with efficacy or influence of United Nations. and. Can India play a role in either United Nations or outside United Nations to exercise some influence to A, protect its own vital security interest and also not be caught up in the allegations of looking at the other side when violations of human rights and war crimes were being committed by, by Israel in Palestine and it betrayed its long-time old friends. Uh, it also has to worry about what is happening in the broader context of Middle East, we cannot talk uh, right off either Saudi Arabia or United Arab Emirates. There, the pendulum has been swinging both ways. At times, we appear, it appears that our relationship with them is much better. They are ostracizing Pakistan. The next day the news comes that they have made up with Pakistan and they are criticizing the Indian conduct, maybe diplomatically, but decidedly so. The situation which is causing greatest concern is Afghanistan. Once the Americans get out of Afghanistan, the AFPAC becomes AFPAC again, which we have to cope on our own. And now the Americans would like us to assume greater responsibilities, but how many greater responsibilities can India assume from Quad to South Asia to Middle East is very difficult to answer. Till we meet again next week, goodbye.